Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar for April 26th, 2021. I'm your host, Jeanette Dapheide. Uh, Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is the Arizona, Arizona State Science DMZ. Our presenters are Douglas Genuine and Chris Kurtz. Douglas is a senior director for research computing in the research technology office at Arizona State University. And Chris is the senior systems architect for the research technology office in the Office of Knowledge Enterprise at Arizona State. Before we begin, I have a few items to note. Uh, first, this presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to ask questions uh, using the chat box. Um, we've been requested to take questions at the end. So as you're watching the presentation, we'll keep track of your questions and then we'll run through them um, toward the end of the presentation. And with that, I will hand things over to Douglas. Douglas, welcome. Thank you, Jeanette. Let me share my screen. As we get that going, thank Jeanette and Trusted CI for the opportunity to speak to you all this morning. As, as Jeanette said, I'm Douglas Genowine, Senior Director of Research Computing at ASU, and presenting with me is Chris Kurtz, Senior Systems Architect in the Research Technology Office at ASU. And we'll talk to you about the Science DMZ and our efforts around that architecture at Arizona State. So a quick overview. <clears throat> excuse me, of what we will go over today. I'll talk about the architecture's motivation and design principles in general, and then dive into ASU's efforts specifically, including the NSF proposal that funded the majority of our science DMZ efforts. So motivation, why do we have this at all? Well, at the end of the day, it comes down to um, it comes down to TCP. And as with most things in life, we can blame this on TCP as well. Um, the need to have this kind of architecture um, because we're, we're using the internet for so many more things than, uh, than, than was originally thought of way back in the, in the old days. Uh, TCP is considered by many, including me, to be a, a fragile workhorse. And for very good reasons, it is a timid protocol um, that has it will interpret packet loss as congestion. And when you combine that congestion, that packet loss rather, with the latency that you might see in a wide area network like the internet, um, you can have real problems with throughput. And these packet loss driven uh, throughput uh, uh, drops are the main, one of the main performance killers in long distance data movement in high performance environments. When we say high performance environments, we mean in laboratories, uh, uh, universities, research centers, places that need to move a lot of data very quickly, very often. And a big source of drop packets can be stateful packet inspection, which is, as you might expect is the kind of thing you would expect a, a, a firewall to do, right? To look at those packets and, and see if it's the kind of traffic that should go through or not. That inspection takes time that can result in dropped packets. So here comes the science DMZ to to, to save us, this reference architecture was put forth in a paper uh, by Eli Dart, Jason Zawoski and friends um, out of the DOE Energy Sciences Network several years ago. And the idea is we're, we're stuck with TCP as much as we would like to change it, we really can't. The internet is pretty well established and TCP is here to stay. So we need to kind of design around it and have something that is easily adoptable because all of these uh, high performance environments, laboratories, universities, already have IT deployments. It is very unlikely that you'll be deploying Science DMZ and central IT from whole cloth at the same time. So you've got to work in the environment you have. And many of these IT environments are, are, are difficult to, to change quickly, right? Drastic change is difficult. We have to work in the environment we have. In addition to that, I just said that firewalls can introduce uh, packet drops. <clears throat> so how do we have cybersecurity? How do we have a defensible environment that is still performant without, or at least using differently, uh, firewalls? We'll talk about security on a slide later on. But it's an important aspect here. We're not just saying get rid of the firewall and your, and your, your performance will be great because there are multiple security considerations as well. 
But it's also important to note that this science DMZ is not an entirely new concept. The idea of a DMZ in, in network land is, is well established. The idea of a separate network enclave at the network perimeter is often referred to as a DMZ. This is a place where you would put lots of external facing services like a, a web application server, something like that. And maybe where you would not put a relational database server, for example. So we can do the same thing, but for science, we can call it the science DMZ. So let's talk about the design principles. What makes a science DMZ a science DMZ? And I like to say that this is presented as a trifecta in four parts. And here they are. This is the science DMZ in one slide, courtesy of ESNet. Thank you, Jason, for the slide. The science DMZ consists of four components. And the first is the one that we just talked about, the, the so-called friction-free network path. And that is enabled by high-speed devices that can speak wire speed, that have deep buffers, um, <clears throat> and that can enforce security through things like router ACLs in a manner specific to science workflows. It is important to note that the science DMZ is not passing traditional general purpose internet traffic. We know what most of the traffic is going over this thing. That allows us to have a slightly different security policy uh, and posture while remaining uh, secure and performant at the same time. And lastly, we want to locate this, this enclave at the network edge or as close to the perimeter as possible, like we talked about on the previous slide. In addition to that is some hardware. We'll use something called a data transfer node, a highly specialized server optimized for, for data transfer with um, a hardware and, op and an operating system tuned for that purpose and, and really not anything else. We don't put other services on these. The tool of choice in data movement is usually grid FTP, but grid FTP by itself is, is a little thick and heavy to, to hand to a user. So we use some web-based middleware called Globus to make that easier. And we'll talk about Globus more shortly. The next piece of hardware is a performance measurement node, just a, another server, a pretty basic server that runs again, one, one job, runs a suite of tools called Perf Sonar, a network measurement test suite specifically designed uh, for, for measuring these kinds of, of, of high performance environments. And lastly, the four, fourth part, the fourth part of the trifecta is engagement with end users. This can't happen uh, without researchers and cyber infrastructure engineers talking to each other and knowing what is going on, knowing when it makes sense to use the science DMZ um, and knowing how to optimize those network paths once research assets have been placed in the science DMZ. We'll talk more about that soon also, but there's your four key parts. As far as architecture, this is the reference, uh, the reference diagram back from uh, 2015. So the, the high bandwidth path is 10 gig here, but the, the idea holds up. The science DMZ itself is the bottom of the picture. You can see there's that DTN and the perf sonar measurement host on the right, <coughs> excuse me, and the campus network on the upper right behind the perimeter firewall. You can see the science DMZ switch hangs off of the institutional border router, or they could be the same device. This is a logical diagram that shows these, these workloads are logically separated, but this is often the same device. And, they, and you can see this provides the science DMZ essentially a direct path out the front door, out to the, the wide area network, the internet on the left, so that those assets in that network enclave on the bottom of the picture can get, out, can get data to and fro from the internet quickly. So perf sonar, the measurement aspect. Uh, perf sonar is a lot of things. It is, it is a widely deployed test and measurement infrastructure. So it's a set of tools used by the Energy Sciences Network, Internet2, regional networks, probably your state research and education network uses perf sonar, the national labs, supercomputing centers, universities, all the places you would expect uh, big data movement to be happening, these high performance sites that we've been talking about. It is also a suite of test and measurement tools specifically for measuring throughput and latency and, and also trace route and an open source collaboration that builds and maintains that software. As, as, as of the time that this slide was put together, at least there were over 1100 test servers around the world. Uh, this makes it very, um, very likely that any place you are moving data to or from uh, has a perf sonar measurement node along that path, if not multiple nodes. And this lends itself to network troubleshooting because again, TCP can be painful. Um, perf sonar is specifically, now there are lots of tools for measuring throughput and latency, right? Why do we use perf sonar? It is specifically designed to find these soft failures that we talked about a few slides back, 
where congestion can be, uh, or packet loss can be interpreted as congestion resulting in lower throughput, um, not, a, not a complete failure of the connection, but enough to compromise a high performance data movement exercise. And Proof Sonar is specifically designed to find these things and help us isolate faults, perform this uh, partial path decomposition from points A to B, um, to look at the performance at perhaps the state network level, the national point of presence, and uh, perhaps the receiving end, another campus. Decompose the path along all of these different points and find, find whatever weirdness lies underneath, uh, asynchronous routes or other things that can lend uh, themselves to these problems. Here's what Perf Sonar looks like. Uh, the picture on the left is a screenshot of the, of the web interface of one of our measurement hosts at ASU, and the dashboard on the right showing that you can, at a glance, see, for example, packet loss between multiple sites to have a, a quick bird's eye view of, of all of the hosts that you are interested in. So let's talk about the data transfer node, that next piece of the trifecta. It's essentially a, a, a highly tuned hot rod server uh, for, for moving data and, and, and nothing else, right? There's no, there's no uh, database servers or, or science gateways or anything else on these uh, single purpose nodes. And in particular, we use the grid FTP protocol to achieve the speeds that you see on the right. And grid FTP accomplishes this largely because it is a parallel transfer mechanism um, to provide speeds much, much better than you can get with traditional SCP. These uh, measurements are taken from uh, Berkeley to Argonne, um, <clears throat> over 10 gigs. So this data is a little old, but you can see the, the, the massive uh, performance increases that we get with grid FTP. Uh, but it gets better because we use Globus on top of that. Globus is a, a web-based middleware that uh, sits atop that grid FTP protocol and allows us to, for example, suspend and resume transfers, provides federated authentication across different endpoints, um, and negotiates the, the, the high-speed transfer between, uh, between two sites. Of course, Globus does a lot more than that that we can't get into today, but um, suffice it to say, Globus is kind of a Swiss army knife of data movement and data sharing. So here's the superfecta, and here's why I said a trifecta in four parts. In the old days, we would present the Science DMZ as DTN, Network Path, and Perf Sonar. But now we include uh, engagement with researchers. We have a superfecta or a trifecta in four parts where we partner with cyber infrastructure facilitators, folks like Campus Champions or um, uh, cyber ambassadors or ACI ref folks and to educate users in the network as a research instrument. We've been doing this in advanced computing for a long time and, and starting to see a lot more traction of this kind of engagement specifically for network workloads uh, nowadays. And the NSF has noticed this by funding a great organization called Epoch, which many of you are probably familiar with. Epoch is, is neighbors with trusted CI uh, at Indiana University, a partnership between IU and ESnet. Um, and Epoch can provide, they're not, they're not gonna do your engagement for you, but they can help you engage and, and teach best practices of deep dives on different research use cases, uh, help us troubleshoot end-to-end -end performance measurement, uh, help you set up Globus and coordination with other campuses, other regional networks, other points along the path. Um, so engagement, um, a very important piece of the Science DMZ architecture. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what can they achieve? Well, they can allow us to close the wizard gap. And the wizard gap was, was coined, I believe, by Matt Mathis of PSC years ago. That's Mathis of, of Mathis equation fame. And, and describes the wizard gap is the, um, the gap between uh, the perceived performance and the nominal speed, what you could get if you were a network wizard. And, and this can be hard. That's why, and especially hard when we have data going off campus across wide area network. From my background in advanced computing, we troubleshoot different workflows on a computing system, right? Or we troubleshoot a scratch file system. But when I'm moving data from one campus to another or acquiring data from a national lab, there's a lot of pieces along that path that I don't control. So I have to engage with my regional network, my state network, my, uh, the Internet2 organization, and perhaps another campus where I definitely don't control the network. So the, the, the nature of the engagement is different. And Epoch has been really transformational in showing folks how to do that. And we're working with them to hopefully close as many wizard gaps at ASU as possible. 
So security, this is Trusted CI. We better talk about security. Uh, what do we do in the absence of a perimeter firewall? Well, we need to think about um, what, what we don't want to do is stand in the way of science, but what we also don't want to do is, is compromise the network and the assets of the university. So those are the two seemingly competing interests, um, but we can make things work together. Um, it's important to remember to bear in mind that the Science DMZ network is not traditional network traffic, right? We're running very few services. In fact, we're probably only running grid FTP, maybe SCP. So there's a smaller number of open ports. We have a minimal network visible attack surface. That's why we don't run any other tools on the DTN. And we use all the other tools that, that aren't perimeter firewalls aggressively. We make sure we patch uh, within a few hours of vulnerabilities or make sure users are trained to identified phishing so their accounts aren't compromised. We have as few accounts on the DTN as possible. We use things like 2FA um, <clears throat> and leverage intrusion detection on, on a copy of, a tra of, of network traffic so that we're not sitting in line with the traffic introducing potential packet loss. So we do all of these different things um, to, to, to enable uh, security in the environment, understanding that this is this is not the general purpose internet. The flows are coming from places where we know what they are. They're coming from another lab, another university. It's not general purpose traffic. So we can have an explicit allow policy on that border router, and we can use essentially firewall rules in the form of ACLs, uh, firewall rules without uh, packet inspection uh, in, in some sense. So that in a nutshell is the, is the security posture and and we employ all of these um, in our DMZ at ASU. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in particular, what are we doing at ASU to, to put this architecture forward? Uh, we wrote a proposal to the, as many of you are probably familiar with, the National Science Foundation's Campus Cyber Infrastructure Program. Uh, Chris and I worked on this at the very end of 2019 and were funded uh, in, in July of 2020. We worked with several uh, researchers at ASU. You can see the, the 11 leading use cases depicted here on the, on the slide. And we partnered with James McCabe from the Central IT Organization, the University Technology Office at ASU, as well as Dr. Lalitha Sankar and Dr. Barbara Monk, two faculty co-investigators whose use cases will be the first ones onboarded into the Science DMZ. And you can see these uh, denoted as, as C10, C11 in the, in the graph here. <clears throat> so we were funded in July uh, for uh, just under 500,000. And what have we done with this? Well, the current state is that this was deployed amid an existing WAN overhaul by Central IT, uh, this transition to a, a fiber ring topology across many points of presence. Uh, Chris will tell us more about that in a moment and being deployed <clears throat> alongside an SDN deployment by Central IT. That's why it's vital to have uh, Central IT represented on the project team. We're very glad to have James working with us on this. As of right now, all of the campus side equipment, all the Tempe campus equipment has been installed and we went online in December, 2020. We have an additional pair of border routers to be installed at an off-campus data center in Iron Mountain Phoenix soon. I think those are those are being purchased and, and we're fighting the, the COVID delays uh, to get those on site. Uh, but the Tempe, Tempe campus is ready to go. In addition to that, we have a VMware uh, virtualization infrastructure to run a variety of security tools, including Artemis, Zeek, and Spoofer, and perhaps some other things that Chris has up his sleeve. Uh, we're running a bare metal DTN, leveraging the Fiona architecture, the Flash IO network appliance uh, popularized by the Pacific Research Platform by our neighbors out in Scenic in California. And that system is running Globus. We just got Globus deployed um, fairly recently. <coughs> Excuse me. And we are, we are playing with the idea of some containerized services on here as well, perhaps running Perf Sonar alongside uh, uh, Globus on that DTN, in addition to the bare metal Perf Sonar nodes residing directly within the Science DMZ. We're also piloting with Dr. Monk and Dr. Sankar some interesting HPC access uh, modalities using a, a specialized access node running open on demand from within the Science DMZ for specific use cases. This would not be a general access system, uh, but for specific use cases where it makes sense, we're exploring that with them. In addition to that, we're working with uh, another IU neighbor, the NetSage organization, 
um, NetSage has been deployed or is being deployed at our state research and education network, the Sun Corridor Network. NetSage analyzes NetFlow software, uh, NetFlow <laughs> data, um, so that you can see where your data is coming from and where it is going to see where your, your big consumers and the big flows are. That's been very valuable to have that visibility from Sun Corridor, and we're excited to work with NetSage on that. We're also working with Epoch for eventually some on-campus deep dives as soon as we can, as any of us can get back on campus, uh, where we will have uh, research engagement sessions with research computing staff with my team and the different faculty members involved in the science DMZ and others as well, and our friends from Central IT uh, to, to have a deep dive on what it looks like to, to troubleshoot and optimize a network connection. <clears throat> Excuse me. And now Chris will give us a Science DMZ technical overview. Chris, uh, please take it away and I will drive the slides as, as you are ready. Great, uh, thanks very much, Doug. Uh, as Doug said, I'm Chris Kurtz. I'm the Senior Systems Architect uh, in the Knowledge Enterprise Organization and uh, Doug is and his team are one of my uh, customers. So go ahead, next slide, please. So uh, physically the equipment, uh, we went with Arista for a number of reasons, specifically uh, deep packets, um, uh, deep buffers. Uh, it's a 7280 R3 pair uh, that's installed in our Tempe, Tempe campus, which is the main ASU campus data center. And uh, the choice of Arista took quite a while. Uh, we looked at uh, pretty much every vendor uh, and we decided on Arista and <clears throat> the research computing group that Doug runs is also Arista focused. Um, interestingly, uh, after we made the selection, uh, Central IT, which is the University Technology Office, as well as Sun Corridor, our REN, uh, pivoted and now use Arista as well, uh, which is meshing quite well. Uh, those, uh, those Aristas are maintained by our Central IT, so they control the routing on them. They also take care of the patching schedule, so it is really part of the university uh, network infrastructure. Uh, the, as Doug said, uh, we're waiting on an additional pair of those uh, Arista switches for our Iron Mountain data center. Uh, we're stuck in uh, COVID delays for those. Um, the 7280 is a great platform. It's got a great number of, of really useful ports, 3200 gig ports and four 400 gig ports. Uh, I say that we're 400 gig capable. Uh, we don't have any 400 gig optics yet and there's nothing to plug into if we did, uh, but we feature proofed in that, uh, in that regard. Um, the Tempe campus uh, has uh, dual campus network cores, and we have a 100 gig feed to each, and we support MPLS, BGP, VXLAN, uh, et cetera. So we've also future-proofed as we move from a traditional Cisco MPLS model uh, to a more uh, uh, flexible VXLAN SDN model. Uh, currently, the customers are Doug's Research Computing Group, uh, the HPC, uh, and uh, local VMs. Uh, that support not only uh, system architecture, like uh, Doug said, uh, Artemis, BGP Mon style things, uh, but also a couple of uh, specific customer use cases where they need unfettered internet access to do, uh, according to the researcher, weird research. Uh, and uh, this is that's all located in our campus data center um, and will eventually move to the Iron Mountain data center. Go ahead, Doug. And so as uh, we were talking about earlier, the Globus DTN personas are, um, single boxes with uh, 100 gig. Uh, we're not expecting to get 100 gig out of them. If you spend any time talking to Jason from Epoch, uh, he will describe how uh, you, it's very hard to get 100 gig out of a single box. And then he will go on to tell you that you really don't want to. Uh, he, Jason and his team and Eli are extremely smart and I agree with them. Uh, so a lot of our infrastructure is 100 gig capable or 100 gig feeds. Uh, and we expect a lot of things that are really gonna be connected at 40 gig or multiple 40 gig. Uh, the infrastructure, uh, hyper-converged infrastructure is VMware, uh, and again, consists of uh, Artemis, which is a replacement for BGPmon, since BGPmon was bought by Cisco, a number of the uh, Internet 2 engineers, um, I think the word is revolted, and decided that they were going to use Artemis instead. Um, and, uh, and so we're looking into Artemis as a replacement there, although uh, BGPmon is not exactly expensive. Uh, Spoofer is an anti-IP spoofing tool uh, just to see if anybody else is trying to advertise uh, those uh, IP ranges. Uh, we're also looking at uh, honeypots and black holes uh, using a number of things, potentially Open Canary uh, and, and other tools as needed. Uh, we're working with central IT um, uh, to give them also a playground and a place to, to be able to run this type of tool in a less structured environment. Uh, other free and open source security tools are available uh, uh, basically uh, as they come up. 
And we have a couple of, as I said, uh, science DMZ users, specifically one uh, uh, who uh, does a lot of interesting things looking at the background radiation, as it was, of the internet and needs unfettered access as well. So he has a couple of VMs testing there. And one of our first use cases in the paper uh, is uh, this HPC login uh, node that we're testing. Uh, we're avoiding the firewall that's not only uh, usually in front of Doug's equipment protecting them, but also the main university um, to uh, look into bandwidth and um, to other TCP related issues. Go ahead, Doug. And so this is a, uh, a logical drawing of the network uh, in 2019 before uh, the major changes uh, by central IT to their network. The Tempe campus in Arizona was the ASU border. Um, all other campuses fed back by redundant 10 gig uh, private uh, link, uh, least links uh, to that campus. And then that reached out to our main Sun corridor internet to pop located at a facility in downtown Phoenix. Uh, we also had redundant uh, internet connections directly to Tempe, uh, but the majority of our traffic traveled through that uh, single 100 gig link uh, to internet to via Sun Corridor. Uh, each individual campus building uh, often had only 10 to 20 gig, uh, and our researchers in their offices uh, were often just at one gig. Research computing uh, spared a, was a bit better. Uh, we had a single 100 gig link with a 10 gig backup. Uh, leading into a 40 gig, dual 40 gig into a traditional uh, next gen firewall uh, and uh, Doug's uh, cluster, including our current one Agave and the existing TTNs were all located behind that firewall environment. So Tempe was very much uh, the, 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 the home of everything. And uh, if Tempe did have issues um, or there was um, any sort of uh, cyber attack, uh, Tempe was the focus of everything and it, it was possible that um, there could be congestion as well as uh, as limitations. So go ahead, Doug. And in the new environment, uh, the central IT made a very wise decision to decentralize uh, from the network perspective. So uh, we uh, purchased from the local, one of the local commercial providers, a private fiber ring. There's actually three of them, one for the East Valley, one for the West Valley, and one for downtown. Uh, these are leased um, and uh, one of those leased to buy dark fiber arrangements. That's 100 gig uh, dual, one in each direction. Uh, that can be extended to almost any place in the Phoenix metro area for uh, uh, a very reasonable cost. Um, and we can also stand up multiple 100 gig links on different um, uh, fiber uh, channels, as it were. Uh, different light waves um, as needed. Uh, so uh, each campus now has a redundant uh, 100 gig uh, going in two directions, uh, and Tempe just simply becomes uh, another site on that. And the concept uh, by James McCabe, our co-I in uh, Central IT, was to simply treat um, the research networks as another uh, element of this ring. And so currently, as you see on the left, uh, the research network uh, data center switch pair in green there as dual 100 gig uh, uh, and supports the various services we've described and also feeds to uh, Doug's research group. On the right is uh, what is going to become uh, just for science use cases. And this is uh, equipment on campus uh, where researchers would connect directly to it. There's a major effort to upgrade uh, the buildings on campus from uh, dual 10 gig to at least dual 100 gig. In some cases, there are certain buildings on campus that have a lot of science activity uh, where they'll go to 400 gig, uh, probably as the optics and, and equipment uh, price drops. Uh, that 7280, uh, Barista series is becoming very popular, uh, and uh, I think that's what campus and the Sun Corridor are going to stabilize on due to the excellent port uh, density and the 400 gig future proofing ports. Uh, so uh, a major change, this next generation network has been in place since the, about the middle of last year, um, finishing up at the end of last year, as Doug said, um, and really tied in greatly to the CC star. Uh, none of this would have been possible before in the uh, in the previous environment. We would have had 100 gig going in, kind of dead ending into a, a network that we could easily overload. And this gives us a much more robust environment. Go ahead, Doug. All right. So thank you, Chris, for the technical deep dive, and uh, we and and thank you again to Jeanette and Trusted CI for the opportunity to talk to you all. And would be happy to address any questions from the from the community.
Great, thanks. Um, I'm going to go ahead and grab the screen real quick, and then we'll go through uh, questions. Um, can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. So um, let me just read through a few um, announcements from Trusted CI, and then we've got some interesting, uh, more detailed questions from the audience. So um, first, Let's go, uh, we're taking questions now. So if you wanna uh, ask a question, please type it into the chat. And then um, our upcoming webinar is Monday, May 24th at 11 a.m. Eastern. The, type, the topic is identifying vulnerable GitHub repositories. And our presenter is Sagar Samtani from Indiana University. And then um, Trusted CI is a partner with the Research SOC, the um, Research Security Operations Center. And their next webinar is uh, building a vulnerability management workflow that works and getting buy-in uh, to Im actually implement it. And so that webinar is going to happen May 27th at 3 p.m. Eastern. To learn more about Research SOC's webinars, you can go to researchsoc.iu.edu um, slash training slash webinars. And then um, Trusted CI released its um, Version, it's, you know, initial version of the Trusted CI framework, and uh, they were welcome to uh, present their their framework to the Research SOC webinar. But that that uh, occurred last month, and so if you're interested in seeing the framework presentation, um, you can go to YouTube, and uh, I can post the link uh, later in the follow up email to access that. And then uh, one more little detail about the, the Trusted CI webinar series. I've been um, converting our webinar over to a podcast. So if for whatever reason, video is not an option for you or you wanna get caught up on other podcasts while you're doing other things, I'll be announcing um, the launch of that uh, pretty soon. But if you are curious, it's already available on Apple Podcasts. Um, I'm working toward expanding it to different uh, podcast uh, services. And with that, thank you for letting me go through my spiel and let's take some questions. <laughs> so this is always a question um, that I think about when we talk about such a um, complicated infrastructure. How many uh, staff from a network server and storage perspective help maintain this environment? Sure, I can speak to that. So um, the core research computing operations team is five people um, and certainly uh, we, we, we lean on Chris's expertise very often as well. Um, so we have uh, Chris from Research Technology Office and James McCabe from Central IT um, and, and me kind of driving the ship. And then RC operations, uh, five additional folks um, uh, run the hardware. We have <clears throat> one or two folks on, on the network side and one or two folks on the storage and compute side as well. So that's roughly five folks in operations. And then we've got a, another question here. For the research computing cluster, you show a firewall. Is that host firewall similar to IP tables or a hardware firewall? The answer is yes. Um, we, it is both. So at least right now, today, the research computing cluster, the Agave supercomputer, is, is behind a Fortinet firewall, a hardware firewall. And we do run host level uh, IP tables on login nodes as well for defense in depth. What we, so that's that's why that, that diagram showed that, because there really is a firewall there. That is why we are exploring through this uh, Science DMZ effort, um, a login node, an access node in the Science DMZ that is not behind the firewall for, for certain access modalities. In addition to that, <clears throat> right now, all data movement, all data ingest on the cluster goes through that login node. We don't really have a dedicated DTN uh, directly for it that doesn't sit behind a firewall. So those will be the two new um, two new pipes, so to speak, into HPC. One, the DTN uh, with Globus outside the firewall, and two, uh, uh, a login node, uh, interactive visualization node for, for certain use cases. Uh, but the short answer to your question is yes, that is two kinds of firewall there. Um, how about this one? How how um, is data integrity protected in a science DMZ? Well, we can think of a, a couple of things there. One, um, we at least for the the Globus endpoint at ASU, I believe we encrypt data in flight. So there's there's um, 
there's no um, there's there's no bare data going through the science team is at least not through Globus. Um, and I think the only other traffic we would have is, is a little bit of SCP, which is also encrypted. Um, I don't believe there is much data at rest in our science team Z as well. You certainly could, um, but I don't believe we have any of that in our case. Most of the stuff jumps over to HPC storage or other things like that. Um, so as far as data sitting out there in the science DMZ that could somehow be compromised, um, I would point back to the, the security slide where uh, we have the very minimal attack surface uh, and encrypted traffic in motion and very little data at rest. Uh, Chris, anything to add to that? Uh, I just mentioned that Globus ensures uh, data integrity with checksums, et cetera, during transmit. Good point. So mm -hmm. but that, that's the key is that for the vast majority of the data, uh, this is a transit network. Uh, this is a way to get data from point A to point B. Uh, data is not residing here, except in specific cases where there are other uh, other systems that are in place to protect data integrity. Mm -hmm. Well, we've, we've got a bunch of uh, um, intrusion detection questions. So uh, here we go. <laughs> uh, can you say more about your approach to monitoring traffic and intrusion detection? How do you approach testing? Chris, that sounds like a Chris question. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's still in process, but the plan is is that there'll be uh, an IDS on a uh, a trunk port uh, that, uh, oh sorry, a, a spanning tree port uh, that will uh, uh, look at any of the traffic uh, that's coming through. Uh, but any of the uh, systems that are directly on uh, on the science DM DMZ that are not behind the the research computing firewall. Uh, we're going to try to make those as much as possible uh, hardened from an, uh, a physical server perspective, run as few services as possible. For example, the DTNs are a great example. There's no SSH running on the outside port. It's only on the inside management port, so you just don't see that. Um, so that significantly limits the attack uh, surface, uh, but they'll be running local um, uh, freeware um, intrusion detection uh, centrally monitored by um, our IT staff uh, as well as Doug's um, RC staff. Um, in the instances where we do have to allow uh, more direct user authentication, uh, uh, such as the test case for Dr. Monk, um, where there will be SSH in, uh, that will be two-factor. Uh, we'll be running local firewalls as well as things like deny hosts or block hosts uh, to prevent uh, uh, attempts to brute force uh, or use a weak password. Uh, we're also going to extremely limit the number of users, and that'll be, again, running local uh, 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 on, on box firewalls as well as on box intrusion detection. Uh, I'm being a little vague because a lot of that hasn't been built yet. Uh, uh, this was uh, things that needed to wait until the environment was up and it took us six plus months to get machines. Uh, so, go ahead. Um, continuing with this theme, do you leverage endpoint detection response tools on the cluster's nodes? And the short answer is yes, but I can't remember what they're called. <laughs> so you can put that in the books as, um, but yes, um, in fact, Chris and our, our IT security officer looked at this. We all looked at this uh, not too long ago, and, and we do have th some things set up there. Chris, do you happen to remember what those tools are called, the things that Lee set up? Uh, so locally on each, so a user can't access a cluster node unless they have a job running on that cluster node. So the ability to protect those is the ability to protect those is uh, you don't need to protect those as much because they don't directly have user interface. Uh, the login nodes also directly run uh, deny hosts, uh, local firewalls, um, and uh, the intrusion, the standard Linux intrusion software, which is also escaping me. Yeah, that was that piece. And spe yeah, specifically login nodes. I don't believe we're running anything specific on uh, on compute nodes. And then uh, if we go back to uh, figure two, um, figure two shows the security components, for example, Zeek IDS protecting the DTN on the left side, but not the DTN on the right side. Is that correct? If so, can you explain the difference? Yeah, so the, the DTN that is located behind the firewall is an older uh, environment uh, and does not run a, a Zeek style IDS. It has a local firewall. It has privilege only accounts, uh, but it is protected by the RC firewall. Uh, we understand that that uh, can potentially uh, cause issues. So the DTN that is outside the firewall will run uh, IDS and will be much more locked down. Uh, in fact, we're looking at potentially making the uh, the 
local disk environment read only. Uh, mm -hmm. So and and have it uh, have updates via uh, some external mechanism. Um, it is still very much a work in progress. Um, and uh, specifically, I wanted to work with the RC staff on ideas that they had and not just be, um, hey, this is what we're going to do. I, I, this is a learning experience for all of us. So the idea would be that the you, you pointed out correctly, the, the equipment that is external needs to be hardened uh, to a much greater extent. Um, and one of the follow up questions Jim had was about um, talked about a limiting Doug talked about a limiting number of ports, but I talked about general user VMs and a login VM. Um, they do add an increased element of exposure. Uh, we limit that in a couple of ways. Is first by uh, a term that's probably familiar to everybody: blast radius. Uh, so we uh, isolate via VLANs uh, and servers um, specific uh, subjects to specific machines. So if there's a Globus machine, all that machine does is Globus. If there's an SSH login server, that's all that server does, and it has the bare number of accounts and the bare number of minimum. Uh, uh, software necessary to do that. So if there is a compromise, uh, it, the scope of that would be limited. Um, and uh, in general, the only people who are going to be logging into anything in the DMZ are staff, um, except for the specific HPC login node, um, and uh, the customer VLAN VMs, which are in their own private VLANs. So if a device is compromised, uh, the blast radius will be limited by being in an isolated network cycle. And we should note that those customer VMs, um, part of the agreement or the, the MOU, the onboarding process, part of the policy uh, governing the science DMZ is that that research computer that we will manage those VMs, the users, customers don't manage their own VMs in that environment. We certainly have VMs in our campus environment that users can manage, but in the science DMZ, uh, we will manage all of them. Uh, thank you. Um, we've got another question about users. Um, if a few users should, oh, if few users should have accounts on the DTN, how do the users move data onto or off of research instruments and computing resources? Right. So the, a couple of pieces to this. Um, a few accounts, and I guess I should specify, few accounts that can log in is is the is the key piece there. But certainly, you want few accounts as well. And we solve for this mostly with Globus. Um, where folks authenticate with Globus through its own uh, identity provider uh, uh, through in common, for example, through their own campus credentials. Um, and we can map those to accounts either on the DTN or in our research computing LTA LDAP. Um, but those accounts don't need to have login capability on the DTN. They just need to ex just, have, just need to have a UID so that we know who owns the files when they land from Globus. Um, so the short answer is we, we use Globus um, and we limit the number of accounts that can log in. Are the hosts in the Science DMZ open to the whole internet or only to research partners? If only research partners, how do you provide access to researchers when not in their home, when not on their home campus? That is a good question. So um, not open to the whole internet, uh, only to research partners. We have an explicit allow policy on the ACLs so that uh, because, <clears throat> because it's not general purpose traffic, we wanna know what kind of traffic it is and know specifically where it's coming from, where it's going. Um, because we don't have uh, a firewall that, that, can, that can inspect every packet and not trust any packet and, and believe it can be from anywhere, um, we do need to know where the data is coming from or where it's going. So we do explicitly allow you know, so-and-so from Stanford or from Chicago or wherever. And what do we do to provide access to, to these researchers when they're not on their home campus? Um, that's that's going to be a snag, right? If they need to perform the same kind of big data movement from some kind of host that isn't always on campus, um, that that's when we haven't been able, we haven't had an opportunity to tackle yet, um, and that we'll need to look at. If they just need access to HPC or to analyze data that's already there, we could leverage VPN or other HPC login nodes to do things like that. But to actually move data from a system that isn't always in the same place, uh, we don't have a use case for that yet. Uh, Doug, I'll, I'll comment that uh, Globus is open to, to the whole world, but the, uh, since Globus only talks to Globus, uh, it provides some limited uh, protection there. So uh, you're authenticated with Globus and then, and then Globus Central is, is acting as command and control to talk uh, to the DTN uh, locally. Uh, in addition, we do have one specific customer who is open. Actually, we'll have two specific customers who are open to the general internet. But these are, uh, in one case, it's uh, uh, 
a specially crafted website for uh, NASA, part of the planetary data system. Uh, and they are receiving, they, you can log into that, or not log in, excuse me, you can access that from anywhere. In fact, a significant amount of that lunar reconnaissance orbiter camera data is accessed from overseas, uh, but that's specifically hardened uh, uh, by that group uh, to allow that. Uh, and there's no authentication or login there. It's, a, it's effectively a static website uh, designed to do just that. Um, and uh, the second thing is, is that the other researcher who's doing what he always likes to refer to as quote unquote weird stuff, um, there are new user facing services there as well. Um, he is, uh, there's nothing listening there. Um, it's all outbound packets um, and then received, but they're open to the internet from the sense that um, they're, they're specifically locked down to very, very, um, known things like HTTPS on a static website uh, that's specially designed to be hardened uh, because we know it's a target um, or outbound connections only where you need to have uh, established related coming back in, uh, that type of thing. But there are no generally, there's no WordPress or, uh, you know, normal SSH or anything like that, unless they're honeypots and then they're totally those exists. Right. That's a good point, Chris. Oh, go ahead. No, 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 I was just, yeah, I was just wondering, there's got to be honeypots somewhere, right? Yeah. There are definitely multiple honeypots. So I think Chris brings up a good point with those two use cases that that are in some sense general use um, and and web facing um, that kind of straddle the the definition of, of traditional DMZ and science DMZ, right? Because it is a somewhat open access thing, right? This NASA data needs to be accessible to the world, um, and it, it is acquired and processed at ASU and and establishing a, a, a host on the perimeter to do that. It happens to be in the science DMZ. Um, it, 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 it takes a little bit of column A and a little bit of column B. Um, so we've got a variety of use cases here. Okay, how about um, collaborators outside of, um, how do you give access to collaborators on a project in the DMZ? Okay, so I, I, I think that means collaborators that maybe aren't ASU, right? Um, what we have right now, um, but we, are, we have developed with the faculty co-PIs, and this is really the kind of the year two of the grant dives into this part, the engagement and the, and the policy and the MOU, um, is we will go through, and this is part of the, uh, part of the, the epoch style uh, researcher engagement deep dive, is who are your collaborators, where are they, how often do you exchange data with them, this whole series of questions, and that allows us to form a, a policy, security policy, and a set of rules, access rules, that can enable that. So the, the, again, the short answer is for the 10 folks that were part of the CC STAR proposal, we've already done that and we know who their collaborators are and we will spin those up as the initial use cases. Going forward, as we roll this out as a research service at ASU, we'll take that, um, that engagement process that we've learned that we've, we've sharpened by working with these 10 close collaborators and have uh, an engagement process similar to what the Epoch folks do to bring in new folks, to have that discussion with them, to, 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 to fill out the MOU and say, here's what you're gonna have access to, here's for how long and those kinds of things. Um, so it's, it's talking to people at the end of the day and then we formalize it in the MOU. Yeah, the other thing I'll add is that uh, we're looking at using Globus authentication with SSH, so that or possibly Eduroam, uh, both in common, uh, related, so that the user, a remote user who's a collaborator, will log in with their local credentials. And that means that the university can take care of their own credentials, et cetera, and will just simply whitelist that user accessing the service um, on a on a case by case basis, on a project by project basis. Uh, one of the things that was really a goal in this and the secure research environment uh, that I also have is to try to allow the user to authenticate with uh, the credentials that they're most familiar with and therefore they're going to protect the most. And that's uh, credentials from their, their local institution versus having, oh, I have an ASU ID and I need to reset the password and I'm going to make it simple because I never remember it, et cetera. So that's a goal. And Chris, I think you just answered Michael's question yeah. about, yeah, about that was it. folks yeah. having accounts. So, Tr trying very hard to to use in common and internet too uh, for uh, Glob both Globus Auth and uh, general Edu Rome style uh, centralized uh, federated authentication federated excuse me not centralized. Great. Um, well, we still have a little bit of time on the clock available uh, for more questions. Um, so I'm going to give people some time. Um, Chris and Douglas, do you have any more? additional comments that you would like to make or uh, other th things that you thought of as these questions were coming in? 
Um, to speak to the the federation part a little bit, that is actually the subject of a of another NSF proposal that we are working on it that we have uh, in flight right now uh, to to normalize federated access to advanced computing and data. Uh, first within Arizona as a pilot with our with our with our um, other public universities in the state, and then to broaden that to to other entities, you know, private entities or other schools or whatever. Um, so, so federated all, all by way of saying that it, science DMZ or otherwise federated access to research assets is is a big push for us. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, the more we move on to these systems, the more we see that federated authentication is really the 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 thing that we need to solve for. And so, we're working with Central IT on expanding our existing uh, way accounts are provisioned to allow. Uh, federated authentication through through other sources, and I really believe that uh, allowing a user to authenticate with the credentials that they're most familiar with, uh, that offer the least privileges, is the way to go here. And that's what we're doing in our secure research environment, uh, as well as this. Uh, we've got two more questions that came in for Globus, so I'll read both. Um, if a user authenticates through Globus, shouldn't you mainly give manually give access to the DMZ resources? And then uh, additionally, how do you handle multi-factor authentication with Globus? Is this even possible? So the, I'll, I'll answer the MFA part. Um, and, and Chris, I'll give you time to think about the question from Jacob, because I'm not entirely certain how to answer that one. The MFA, um, it's been a while since I personally have set up Globus, but uh, the way that we do it is, is uh, leverage in common so that when folks log into Globus from wherever, from ASU or, or any other place, uh, they'll be presented, if, if they are in common members, they'll be presented with the login page for their institution. And if their institution uses MFA, it's their institution's MFA that we are using and trusting there. So when I log into Globus, I get the ASU login screen, I type in my creds, and I get a, a dual prompt and I, I log in and now I'm authenticated into Globus as well. Uh, so we personally are not running MFA specifically with Globus for the DMZ. We're leveraging the providers of, of all the uh, in common members. Yeah, exactly. And that's the other reason you want to you want them to use their home credentials is that's going to be the second factor that's already set up. Most universities, I think, are now moving to uh, two factor being required. Certainly ASU is doing that. Uh, so uh, where possible, let's leverage that that's already exists. Uh, and um, the second thing is, let me see, Jacob asked, but if user authenticate through Globus, shouldn't you manually give access to DMZ resources? So uh, Doug, you want to talk a bit more? You were about to say something. I, well, if Jacob, if I understand your question right, it sounds like perhaps you're saying if 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 anybody can log into Globus with their own creds, does that mean can anybody get at the DMZ? Um, and and that's certainly not something that we want, right? Um, so, without getting into the the guts of Globus, there's there's user mapping that can happen there and access control that can happen there, so that even if you can authenticate, you may not be authorized to access the DMZ, and that the that functionality is there in Globus. Great, and um, I, I think they responded that yes, that you oh, okay. understood the question okay. correctly. Thank yes. you, Jacob. Um, so another question is, uh, has there been any discussion around pushing the high-speed research networks into campus buildings? Um, the, the short answer is yes, and, and I bet Chris knows a lot more about it. Yeah, uh, so a, a significant portion of the infrastructure uh, for central IT is, is uh, taken care of via bonds uh, from the Arizona Board of Regents. And so uh, in the bond that is coming up uh, that uh, Doug and his group and I have asked for significant funds uh, from for uh, infrastructure is also, uh, we've identified about 14 buildings on campus that certainly need um, higher speed uh, network. And we're looking at upgrading or replacing the fiber uh, that, uh, uh, that ties those in. Um, ASU is uh, from the Western United States considered to be a, an old campus. Uh, from the eastern United States, I would say that's probably not accurate, and some of the eastern uh, uh, infrastructure people on campus would laugh uh, when we talk about buildings that are 50 years old. Uh, but uh, a number of the, the campus tunnels uh, require a significant amount of work to, to be safe, uh, um, to pull new fiber. Um, there is a lot of multi-mode uh, that needs to be replaced, and so a significant number of, I think I said, 14 buildings have been identified um, as uh, science hubs. Um, to be upgraded to single mode, um, uh, multiple single mode, or to have the optics and patching upgraded to 100 gig versus 
uh, 10 gigs. So in the next six months, six to nine months, this calendar year, I think we'll see a significant number of those upgraded, uh, uh, the places where we have identified uh, hotspots. Great. Uh, last call for questions uh, from the audience. This has been awesome. The engagement has been wonderful. So I really appreciate all these questions that came in. And um, any other, uh, any interesting um, projects coming up or there are things you want to promote, Douglas or Chris? Uh, stay tuned for next uh, next year's presentation. We'll tell you all about year two and when we have all of these things up and running and, and everything will have worked perfectly, I'm sure. Absolutely. That's how, that's how it always works. <laughs> Chris? Uh, yeah, so in addition to this, uh, my focus for the next year is going to be our secure research environment, uh, which I stood up uh, during COVID uh, to support COVID uh, research and testing at ASU. Uh, and I'm working with a number of researchers on uh, kind of version two of that and uh, what, what uh, the researcher I'm working with called science response. Um, and I'm very eager to, to work with Doug and his team on that and do some great things. Well, thank you very much. Um... Douglas and Chris for uh, presenting and thank you those of you in the audience for attending. I will be sending out a recording of this presentation later today along with the link to the slides. And um, again, uh, thank you everybody for attending and I hope you have a great day.